This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. So we can pull some threads out of people's responses, right? The idea that a third of this into the month, may Allah accept it from us, it creates an opportunity now for us to go in different directions, but there's a deep opportunity to now engage in self-reflection. The idea that says we are in a sphere of existence that you're able to, in the absence of certain things, I had family and now I don't. I had time and now it's different. Something was something before and now it's not. There's room for contemplation for each of us, but you want to get to a place where it goes to its end point ultimately. Because in our tradition, the idea is not to just recognize the na'mah, the blessing, the gift, right? That's one part to it. I don't see my family anymore. And I realize now what it was like to have them when I don't have them. I don't have the time I had last year. And I now recognize what that was like when I had actual engagement of it. Or now in relation to what I did not have, I do have and it creates for me. And that's important because it's a vision modifier, the ability to recognize ni'mah, even in retrospect or in the present. But what our tradition builds itself off of is not just the recognition of the gift, but we also want to then recognize the giver of the gift. So you take the reflection of the ni'mah and you make it a means to understand al-mun'im, the giver of the gift, Allah. At this point in our respective relationships with our faith, we all have different entry points to it. Some of us have been deep in our practice of Islam ritualistically for quite some time. Some of us are in a place where we are just learning about what Islam means, even if we were born into it. Some of us might have been formally Muslim for just days, if not even less. And some of us might be in this place where we're trying to figure out, is this a religion that's even right for me? There's not a right or wrong in terms of where we are in our trajectory. It's not meant to be a lonely journey. The idea is that we are all journeying together, but in that journey, we still have subjective recognition of what we're bringing personally, our strengths and our non-strengths. And Ramadan affords an opportunity now in the process of self-reflection to gain a little bit more clarity. And in that clarity, you want to have deliberate understanding of both who you are, but through a recognition of who you are, who is God to you? And that becomes really hard at times in a society that deeply embraces the secular that doesn't see materialism as something that is godless in the sense that we don't talk about God, but it gives us a sense of a secular that recognizes that this existence is simply it, and there's not more to it than that. I want you to think deeply within yourself, right? We have a narration of, we have a genre of hadith literature that's called the hadith qudsi, often translated as the sacred hadith. It follows a construct that says the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah said, and then it says what Allah has said. And in one such narration, the Prophet ﷺ says that Allah has said, that I am as my servant thinks I am. That the God you believe God to be is the God that you end up fundamentally worshiping. And the paradox of decision making is that when you don't make a choice, you've essentially chosen. And so if you have an unconsciously derived understanding of God, that's not to anthropomorphize the divine in any way, right? Because the verse is true. That there's not anything that's like a likeness to Allah. That whatever you think of him to be, you know that he is other than that. And the knowledge that we have theologically that defines Allah to us is a negative knowledge, not a pessimistic knowledge, but it's rooted in this idea that what we know of Allah is that we are not able to fathom in that way. So there's not anything that's like a likeness to him. That conceptualization still is not who we understand him to be. Does that make sense? But fundamentally, there are key points that we are given understandings through divine names. 
extrapolating meanings from what it was that we found within prophetic tradition and stories of previous luminaries of our tradition, that they have a relationship with the divine that enables them to now not simply be in a moment of engagement that is rooted in externals that are filled with just ease and facility, but that relationship is there in moments of struggle, moments of achievement, moments of grief, moments of anxiety, that their contentment is not that they're just laughing all the time, but their balance is also enables them to be sad, to have grief, to have anxiety, but they're still nonetheless able to feel empowered in their relationship with Allah. Now, I want you to think about this within yourself. If I was to ask you, who is God to you, what would you say to me? And not on a theoretical sense, not about what do you worship in terms of, are you somebody who worships your physical being? Are you worshiping beauty? Are you worshiping money? That's not what I'm talking about. That's a different kind of conversation. But I'm saying in the frame of your relationship with your creator, you can dress how I dress. I can eat what you eat. We can pray the way others pray. We can follow in the formula, the mechanics. You can't believe something just because somebody else believes it. Belief now comes from within you. Your heart is a seat of different convictions and values. May Allah grant us hearts that are deep in his remembrance and hearts that find themselves in a place of stillness and tranquility. But the God that you believe God to be is the God that you worship. And if you never sat down to think about it, what better time than in the month of Ramadan? The now where the physicality of situations are not the focal point. The ability to be in a place where it's refreshing to be in gatherings, which is a blessing, right? Because there's some spaces you can go, and it is not refreshing to be a lot around a lot of Muslims, right? It is not fun. It is terrible. Some of us have been there. May Allah make it easy for us. So alhamdulillah for the gift of community that I actually enjoy being a part of. And alhamdulillah for the recognition and the ability to understand that it's okay for me to relate to something differently from somebody else or to be able to perceive what was there for me that's not there so that now as I move forward to design my life, rather than having someone design it for me, I'm building in what it is that I need so that I have time for this. I want you to think in the midst of all of this where clarity is coming and you're learning about yourself, openings are there, opportunity to think and reflect. Who is a law to you? Who do you understand him to be? I had this conversation with a couple. One was born into Islam. One was a convert to Islam. And this is not to generalize, but to just give you a trajectory of how sometimes we land on where we land. And they're married. They're doing amazing, mashallah, in their relationship. But at this point, prior to... They hit a critical juncture that the one who is a convert said to the one who was born into it, who's God to you? And the person who was born into it, they just froze. They didn't know what to say. We're now sitting, the three of us in my office, and there's just clearly a tension. How can you have been Muslim your whole life and you've never thought about this? There's not really room to express because the stakes are pretty high. I'm trying to marry this guy. Not me. I wasn't trying to marry the guy. The girl was trying to marry the guy. I'm married to my wife, who I love very much. (laughs) And so she's now in a place where there's opportunity to explore. And she says, no one's ever asked me this question before. And as she makes herself more vulnerable and she's deconstructing the idea that she's so paralyzed because she doesn't want to say the wrong thing. It has to only always be always absolutely right. 
Otherwise, I'm not supposed to say anything. And that's different from hadith that says, Man kana yu'minu billahi wa bil yawm al-akhiri falyakul khayran o li yasmud. That whosoever believes in Allah on the last day, let them speak good or be silent. The ability to engage in expression of ideas and reflection and contemplation is a necessary component to becoming more sound in the development of what is there with the depth. And as she's opening herself up and she's making herself vulnerable, her now husband needs to understand that she's just as entitled to her journey spiritually as he is. And it's not going to look the same way. But for you and I sitting here now, has anybody ever asked you or have you ever thought about it for yourself? And don't think about it in a self-deprecating way. Don't think about it in a way that puts you on edge. You're walking on eggshells. But think about it within yourself. What is happening in the dissemination of our religious tradition that you can get to a place that you and I are at, right? I'm turning 40 this year. I'm not the oldest person in the room. I'm definitely not the youngest. And some of you are my age, some of you are younger, some of you are a little bit older. How did so many of us get to a place in our journey of Islam and we've never thought about who God is to us? And no one has ever asked us, who is God to you? We've not been in a space where we've been able to reflect upon what that is. It's not about just rotely regurgitating what we memorize, right? My six-year-old son, Kareem, he memorized Surah Ikhlas when he was three, mashallah. And we used to go out on the street. I'd push him in the stroller. He'd be on the subway. He'd be in the bathtub screaming out Surah Ikhlas. Be like, Kareem, man, not when you're not wearing clothes, bro. It's not something you should do. But he's just spitting out the words. And that's great for him, mashallah. His capacity as a child can innately understand the existence of a God. The same way his big sister, Medina, children are pretty remarkable to be able to reflect on your own spiritual state and to just understand conceptually where they are. I've never had to sit down and say to them, this is what it means to have a God. Because they can get it. You can't innately understand other things. The existence of books and angels and prophets. We're not built in that way, wired to just innately understand some of these things. Some of these things we have to deconstruct. But now to get to a place where you can innately understand God exists, that doesn't now mean, though, that you feel empowered in that relationship with your God. You can believe that Allah exists. You can believe Allah is the creator of all things. Does that mean, though, that you believe that he is the most merciful of those who show mercy? There's five divine names that we are taught that come from a shared root of Rahma. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahman, Khair Rahimin, the Rahma. These are all names that we are given to identify the divine by that are about mercy, about compassion. And rahmah in our tradition isn't just mercy the way that, unfortunately, in supremacist society, we think about mercy and law the way we think about how it works here. I pass a red light, I got caught, I get a ticket, there's punishment and fines. That's not what Sharia is about. Sharia is about aspiring to a higher form of ethical conduct. To get to a place where your self-actualization is epitomized and being able to recognize that you are abd. You rely on something to exist. And Allah is ghani. He is free of need. So you are going to want to rely on the one that does not rely on anything for existence. Allah is self-sufficient. The ability to now reflect necessitates having spaces of reflection. Can we have everybody just move up in here? People are coming in. If you guys want to just come forward a bit. If we can leave some room so that people have room to pray on the sides too, so that they're not praying in the doorways as well. So in this month of Ramadan, 
you want to start to reflect on some of this. Because Islam is a God-centric religion. Everything goes back to God. The beauty of having God-centered is then we have a sphere of existence that transcends diversity. We are not just simply connected at the level of shared race, ethnicity, class, gender. We are in a sphere of existence that recognizes the value out of all those who are present. And you believe in a God that is a God of all creation. And the recognition of a God that's a God of all creation enables us now to be able to formulate deeper relationships through the recognition of that. But I want you to just think about it primarily in terms of your own gain and your own benefit. Likely some of you were taught the word fard and haram before you were taught who Allah is or how to even reflect on that. You were taught to pray your sunnah prayers before you were taught whose sunnah you follow. A messenger of God, a book of God, a house of God, any of these constructs of God, they're simply meant to draw attentiveness, not back to themselves, but attentiveness back to God. How can it make sense? How can it make sense that you live decades of your life, years of your life, in a religion that claims to be about submission to the divine, and you've never thought about who the divine is to you. How is that not a treachery, a trick of shaitan? To get you to a space that is just about the form, it's just about the mechanics, it's just about the externals. Part of your Ramadan experience is going to be about getting comfortable in learning new things, including learning about yourself, but also part of it's going to be about unlearning things that you might not even know are there. Ours is not a gender to God. We get heavily influenced by supremacist society that promotes now deeply a Judeo-Christian narrative, and of that one that is heavily rooted in a Christian narrative, that gives us now not a grammatical understanding of a masculine God, that that's just how Arabic functions as a language. Because means that Allah is not anthropomorphized in any way the ways that we understand it. But when you are constantly bombarded by imagery, not just of a masculine, grammatically masculine God, but of a male God, God is a father, God is a son in this way. And it becomes purposeful now that the imagery of that becomes laden in what validates a modern day shirk that is supremacy, that is whiteness. You will become implicitly and unconsciously impacted by that. Many of you believe in a God that is not simply an angry old man in the sky looking for a reason to punish you. But if he is an angry old man, then you're also understanding him to be a man. That's not what the God of Islam is. Do you get what I'm saying? The paradox of decision-making is when you don't make a choice you have chosen. And if you have not consciously formulated for yourself a recognition of the divine entity that you are seeking to build a relationship with, it doesn't mean you don't still have a conceptualization that's there unconsciously. Who is God to you? When I was younger, I didn't really engage my faith in those ways. As I got older, I started to think about it a little bit differently, but my entry point into a community like this felt good as an identity variable. I liked being around people who had similar life experiences, who got what it was like to be somebody of my background, where quite often I was the only one that was a Muslim or the only one that came from my culture, or the only one that had to be able to navigate multiple spheres of identity. And then it slowly transitioned into being about values and ethics. And in the last, I don't know how many years of my life, the beauty of the depth of this religion that has been something that took time to peel layers away from 
And now it's just about who is God to me? And recognizing that what I was reading in the Quran, what I was reading in the Hadith, the God that those people believed in, and the way that that belief made them feel empowered, that's not what my understanding of God was doing to me. You would read Hadith where the Prophet وسلم, would see with his companions a mother with a child in the aftermath of a battle, and they're separated in a state of disarray and anxiety, as any mother would be in that state, as well as any child. And when they come upon each other and they find one another, and they engage each other now as a mother and child would who had been separated, you can picture it in your head. Picture it in your head. And the Prophet وسلم, is the best of teachers, utilizing opportunity to illustrate now principle that is key to the development of one's relationship with their own heart. Do you think this mother would ever harm her child? Do you think she would throw him into a fire? Of course not, O Messenger of God. Allah loves his creation more than a mother loves his child. Allah loves his creation, is more merciful to his creation than a mother is to his child. I wanted to believe in that God. In the hadith, the Prophet وسلم, is with his companions on a caravan. They come upon some Bedouins and they now have a meal with them. And there's a Bedouin woman who's cooking at a pot. And as she's cooking at a pot that's resting on flames, her child now comes to touch the pot. And she pushes the child's hand out of the way. And now she engages the Prophet وسلم, Are you the one that claims to be the messenger of God? And he says, yes. The one who claims that God is the most merciful of those who show mercy. And he says, yes. Because in a Mecca in Arabia, the concept of Ar-Rahman was non-existent. Accountability also didn't exist because an afterlife wasn't there conceptually. This is why you can treat people like garbage. Because if you really believe in the last day, you really believe in eternal existence, you really believe you're going to stand in front of Allah, you're not going to gossip, you're not going to be racist. You're not going to cheat and backbite and be unethical in order to advance yourself materialistically. You are going to recognize the proportionality of this world in terms of what comes next. And that this is a place that will be a key determinant in terms of where you land there. May Allah make us all people of Jannah. And so this woman is asking the Prophet وسلم, you're the one that claims to be a messenger of God, the one that claims that God is the most merciful of those who show mercy? He says, yes. She says, then know this. As he continues, she asks, the one that claims that God is even more merciful than a mother is to his child? He says, yes. She says, then know this. A mother would never let their child feel any pain. And our prophet responds by just lowering his head and crying. That's the God I wanted to believe in. I wanted to believe in the God of Abraham. That when he is catapulted into the fire, and Allah commands the fire to be cool, and the angel comes and says that I'm here to assist you. And he says, are you my Lord? And the angel says, no. He says, and I have no use for you. Real yakin, real certitude. God does for me. God is the one that provides for me. I'm not the provider of provision for my kids and my wife. I'm not the one that's putting things there for them. Allah is the provider of my children. Allah is the provider of me. And it's hard if there's not opportunity to sit and reflect so every part of me wanted to believe in that God. Every part of me wanted to have that kind of relationship. Every part of me wanted to believe as the Prophet Ibrahim, when he is engaging his people about what they worship and what he worships. And he says that that's not what my God is like. My God feeds me and gives me drink. My God heals me of all my ailments. He knows who his Lord is. Who is yours? You just think about it. 
in this month of reflection. Some of you have heard me tell this story before, and I'm going to tell it again, where some years ago, before my son Karim was born, my daughter Medina was about two or three. My wife Priya and I, we went to California where I was giving some talks in Ramadan. And our community, alhamdulillah, is one that is really remarkable. And when I go to places, I always try to link up with people who used to live here, went to school here, they worked here and now lived somewhere else. And every place I travel, man, alhamdulillah, it's like I have a family there. And I met with so many people who they took us to watch the sunset over the San Francisco Bay before it thawed one night. Really beautiful, beautiful scene. And to get a better view, we were going up this hill that was close to where the water was. And along the way, we came upon a lookout point where someone had placed some rocks to help get to eye level of some telescopes. My daughter, Medina, some of you have seen her. She's now nine, mashallah, it's crazy. She's got like the soul of a 60 year old man. I don't know what's going on with her. My daughter's favorite candy is milk duds. <laughs> what kind of child likes to eat milk duds? If that is not an old man candy to eat, I don't even know what she's gonna be like when she grows up. But I told her this morning, the baby, I know that whatever it is you're gonna do, you're gonna be a great woman when you grow older. She's an amazing, amazing person, mashallah. Now she's two, that same life that she has, it's just emanating from her. A lot of laughter, a lot of just joy. And these rocks that were placed in front of this telescope, she's jumping on them from rock to rock to rock. And as she's going, she suddenly slips and falls and hits the ground really hard. And my baby girl has never really hurt herself. She gets some bumps and bruises here and there. And if that happens, either myself or Priya would just grab her, hold her close to us as we could so that she would feel comfort while she's crying until the tears would stop. And so Priya instinctively grabbed Medina and held her close. And as she turned to where we were, and we could now see her profile, there's a deep gash on Medina's head. And the blood was just falling everywhere. All of us moved in every direction we could to find water and tissues, anything to stop. My wife, she just stood there holding my baby the whole time, frozen. We got Medina patched up. She even started smiling a bit. Priya still did not put her down. We went to a place where I gave a talk. We had iftar with some people at that place. Iftar finished. We got in the car and we went to have a second dinner. I don't know a lot of people do that. Don't judge me. And the whole time, she's still holding Medina in her arms. We then got into a car to go to the hotel, still carrying our baby. We get into the hotel now at about midnight. She lays with her in the bed, still holding her in her arms until she knows she's fully asleep. And then she rests her against the pillow and then just stands and stares at her. I could tell that if there was anything my wife could have done to have kept our child from being hurt, she would have done it. That even if she had to take the pain again and again, over and over, so Medina would not feel any type of pain, she would have willfully taken it. And in that moment, I asked myself, do I believe in a God that loves me more than my wife loves our daughter? Do I believe in a God who cares for me, believes in me, is not simply watching me, but watching over me more than Priya is Medina. And it was really hard, but I got to a place eventually where I said yes. Rabi al-Basri, may Allah's mercy be upon her, a great spiritual master of our tradition. She says famously that I will not serve God like a laborer in expectation of my wages. 
that my doing for the divine is not a transactional relationship, but I simply do because I desire to do. There's love there. There's positivity rooted there. Can we move up again? Just so people are not crowding into the doorways. If you guys want to move up on this side too, you can come up close if you want. Don't worry about the cameras. That's what you want to attach as purpose for yourself in this month of Ramadan. You want to dig deep and you want to understand that this is not ritual that's just for the sake of it. It's not an ends, but it's a means to something. You want to be in a place where the liberty that comes now from being able to believe and embrace in a divine entity that's watching over you, that wants what's best for you. You can look at just our tradition, but the way you see it is an extension of you. Somebody asked me about making up prayers, and they said that I'm so dismal. There was a time in my life where I didn't pray at all. What should I do? And they're reading hadith that talk about the angels checking your deeds, your prayers before anything else. May Allah make our judgment one that is filled with ease and grant us entrance into his paradise with no judgment. And the hadith that says the angels, they're going to look at your prayers. And if there's deficiencies, they go back to Allah. And they say, the Ya Rab, there's gaps in their prayers. And Allah says to the angels, go back and look and see if they did anything extra. Any of the sunnah, any of the nawafil, something to just compensate, something to fill the gaps. Because that's who your God is. He looks for a reason to accept, not looks for a reason to push away. Looking for any excuse, any reason. To give you what it is that you are meant to be an inheritor of, the Quran says. It was written for you. You just have to choose as to whether or not you're going to do what you need to acquire it. And that first step is critical. And I am as my servant thinks I am. Who is the God that you worship? Who is the God that you believe in? The one that you prostrate to? The one whose sake you're fasting for? Why are you keeping yourself from eating food? For whose sake? Why are you keeping yourself from drinking water? For whose sake? And that conceptualization, it's important. Deconstructing it to a place that as best as you can, you believe in Allah in who he tells you he is. Some of the modes of reflection have to be proactive. You don't want to just think about who God is in the aftermath of difficulty. Allah must be punishing me because I didn't get married to this person. Allah must not like me because I'm not able to have this job. God must be angry with me for all of these different reasons. It's not transactional. Believe in a God that if something's being kept for you, you might not understand it, but there's benefit in it nonetheless. Ours is not a religion that is framed on a God-centric perspective. That says that I have to fully understand everything in order for it to make sense or be valid. A God-centric religion says and assumes that there's certain things that God will ask you to do that you enjoy doing, certain things that God asks you to do that are difficult to do, and certain things that God asks you to do that you might just not understand, but your reliance is that God is the most wise, not me. When I can start to now craft that conceptualization, it makes it a lot easier to take on the world in comparison to when I have uncertainty of what tomorrow is going to bring for me, complemented with an unfamiliarity of who the divine is. And those two uncertainties butting heads together, they're going to cause all kinds of conundrums inwardly. Versus, I don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. I literally don't know. And it's not a morbid thought. I wake up in the morning. I don't know if I'm coming home at night. But if I have certitude in what's going to give me upliftment, if I have real yaqeen, real understanding that this is defined and concrete, Allah's promises are true. 
It makes the traversing of this world a little bit different. Take some time in this Ramadan to pause. Open a notebook and just write at the top, who is God to me? And then write an answer. Can we have everyone move up again? Sorry. I told you it's going to get busier as we get to longer. And then every so often, keep visiting, revisiting, engaging in that, allowing for yourself to be in a space where you take advantage of it. And it'll create a paradigm shift. What most of us do is we take our life experiences to be the determining factor of who Allah is to us. What I'm saying is that you want to reflect on Allah and then make sense of your life experiences in relation to that reflection. In a place where your heart is starting to now become sovereign, the nafs is being tamed because it's not being fed incessantly. You are exposed now in a third of Ramadan to community, conversation, organically, spaces that have the presence of barakah to them. It is impacting your inward. The openings are present to create more openings. So with deliberate deliberation, you want to think about in the coming weeks, going into the last 10 nights, whose sake are you standing for, looking for Laylatul Qadr? And it's not going to take you hours, man. It's just moments. You push the clutter away. You push everything that's distracting and agitating. Who is God to me? Who is the one that I worship? When you start to build that relationship, it's going to change everything categorically. Just as we go into Maghrib, I want you to think about this now in a second prism. That first prism was subjective. That's not egocentric. It's not nafsi. Your relationship with Allah is yours. I want you to think about it now in a second prism, about how you then serve as a reminder of God to others. That you remember me and I remember you and be grateful to me and do not be ungrateful. May Allah make us from the shakirin. You want to start to understand that there are many people that come to spaces like this. And your interactions with them do not have to be that you are something other than what you are. You are beautiful because God said he made you beautiful. Recognize your own luminosity this Ramadan. If you don't know the answer to something, don't answer it. You don't want to give somebody information thinking that it's what they need, when in reality, your answer is rooted in the discomfort of saying that I don't know how to not give. And so I'm just going to say, regardless of recognizing what the impact is, because people are going to take your words. They're going to take your interactions. They're going to take how you engage them to not be anything that's representative other than you but to understand that by virtue of interacting with you, they are going to now take that potentially as a means of giving insight as to, well, this is a Muslim who's here in a Muslim space in the Muslim month of Ramadan where Muslims do certain things. So this is how Muslims must be. I met a convert in the UK who came from a Punjabi background. She was a Sikh woman. And she said it took her seven years to convert to Islam. And I said, why did it take you so long? What was it that you were wrestling with? And she said, everything in this religion made sense. There was no part of it that I read that did not make sense. She said, it just took me seven years to meet Muslims that actually represented what I was reading in the Quran. There's not a knock on anybody. Because you don't want your mind to take you to a place that says, man, there must be people who are doing crazy things. They're doing haram. They're doing this, doing that. Don't give shaitan victory over you. 
I want you to hear what she said in the context of what we talked about for the last 30 minutes. And maybe her difficulty was that it was hard for her to meet Muslims who really just embodied a relationship with the divine. Muslims who felt strong in their relationship with God. Muslims whose relationship with Allah replicated what the Quran said your relationship with Allah should look like. Muslims who found strength and confidence. Muslims who were unapologetic in their identity, not because they were arrogant or they were people who sought to elevate themselves by denigrating somebody else. But Muslims who found love in their relationship with the divine, who connected to Ar-Rahman, who understood that the word Rabb was not just Lord, but Rabb is Al-Malik, Rabb is Al-Sayyid, Rabb is Al-Mun'im, Rabb is Murabbi, Rabb is Mudabbir, Rabb is Al-Qayyim. He's nurturing, caretaking, cultivating. You hear these words recited to you at night. Let them penetrate your inside. When you break your fast, you think about it. What does it mean? The hadith that says, لِسَاعِمِ farhatan farhatun inda iftarihi wa farhatun inda liqa'i rabbi That for the fasting one, there's two farhas, two joys. There's a joy when they break their fast, and you get that one, right? It's good to eat after you haven't eaten. And then there's a joy when they meet their Lord. How you start to build that relationship here is then what's going to make it exciting there. May Allah make us from amongst those who have a joyful meeting with our Creator. That's all I'm asking you to do. Start to think about what these things mean. I am as my servant thinks I am. You cannot believe in God in the way that the person next to you does because belief comes from here. You start to spend time with your heart in reflection, in contemplation. You build a relationship with your Lord that you are entitled to have a relationship with. Don't let anybody take it away from you. Don't let the end of Ramadan take it away from you. Don't believe that somebody else is supposed to be the one that's in the rows of prayers. You are. It's not somebody else that's supposed to be reading God's book. You are. It's not somebody else that's supposed to be benefiting from that relationship. You are. You allow for yourself to make that a determinant in your relationship with Allah. And then with real positivity, real love, real gratitude, everything that renders confidence, you continue to build that relationship with Allah. I want in this Mubarak moment, just as Maghrib comes in in a minute, now for you to just take a minute. That's all it is. It's a mental exercise as a spiritual exercise. Think within yourself as you get ready to break your fast, this question. Who is God to me? That's all I want you to think about. And in the stillness, the silence, regardless of what's coming from the park, just reflect for a minute, and then we'll call the Adhan, inshallah, and we'll break our fast together. But that's all I want you to think about. This question, who is Allah to me? Who is my God? If you would like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org slash donate. For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org slash classes. If you have any questions, email us at info at icnyu.org.